lark, our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly. Scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved, and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. This is a CBC News special presentation. Once a year, Canada falls silent to remember. We remember those who fought for our freedom and the tens of thousands who paid the ultimate sacrifice in wars that stole generations. We remember those who survived, but whose memories are seared with the horrors they witnessed. From coast to coast to coast, sons and daughters, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters. We mark their service. We owe it to them to remember. We owe it to ourselves to never forget. The National War Memorial in Ottawa on a chilly, blustery day in the nation's capital, but on a day where there are still thousands lined up here an hour away from the beginning of this memorial service. Uh, chilly, as we say, it's a kind of parka kind of day, temperatures hovering around zero. And good morning, I'm Peter Mansbridge. We are approaching that hour again, that 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. It is, of course, Remembrance Day, and over the next couple of hours, we will bring you the national ceremonies from here in downtown Ottawa. Let me situate the National War Memorial for you here. Of course, the most famous structure in this town of the Parliament buildings, but not far from the Peace Tower, just a couple of hundred meters away, actually, the National War Memorial, and that is where today's ceremony will take place. Everyone will be here, the Prime Minister, the Governor General, Chief of the Defence Staff, and many, many veterans. Helping us tell that story today, Anna Thibodeau and Rosie Barton, who are down in that chilly weather today, but along with so many people with warm hearts on a day where they are remembering. Hannah, your thoughts? Well, you talk about many, many veterans, Peter. However, the veterans from the Second World War coming out to this national service are getting smaller and smaller. Remember, one million Canadians served in the Second World War, but as of March of this year, only 61,000 still live. So yet their faces are starting to diminish. However, I was just up there, I was chatting with a few of them. Those are the people that we really love to talk to are the veterans who paid their uh, service and are here today out in this chilly, chilly weather to make sure that they remember their friends and their lost ones who didn't make it back from the war. Hannah's got some great stories to tell us uh, this morning and through the next couple of hours. So we'll be back to Hannah in a bit. Rosemary Barton is with us as well. Rosie? Well, Peter, this is also a morning to remember the people that are still serving, the soldiers that are serving now and overseas, whether it be in the current conflict in Iraq, whether it be trying to stabilize the situation in Ukraine. We are more, more people uh, headed over on a peacekeeping mission. We are expecting that announcement sometime towards the end of the year. And uh, more people going over to the Baltics as well as part of that Operation Reassurance. So it's not just about those who have fallen, it's also to pay tribute to those who who are still serving. All right, Rosie, thank you. You know, it's times like this, we uh, want to remember why we're here, and this is why we're here.
And with me, as he always is on days like this, the CBC's former senior correspondent, Brian Stewart. Brian, um, they call it Remembrance Day for a reason. We're here to remember. Talk to me about remembering. Well, it, it, this day drives home just what a remarkably ingrained fact, the act of remembrance, that, that obligation, that debt you mentioned, is to this nation. It's, it's remarkable to think this is the great epicenter of the nation's remembering. It's the core of remembering. But right across this country, there are 6,000 monuments to Canada's war dead. And scattered in foreign fields all around the globe, the graves of Canadian soldiers who, who've died, and, and, and 118,000, it's been estimated as many. So, I mean, it is a sense that we have in this country that we have an absolute debt and obligation because they died for our future. Their real monument is in our future. But we remember and we come back to see this core place every year uh, to reassure ourselves and, and memory itself that there is no forgetting, not in this country, not ever. You know, throughout the next uh, couple of hours at different times, we're going to be asking Canadians from coast to coast to coast to tell us who they are remembering on this day. Here's the first of those. I'm Danica and I'm from Cochrane, Alberta. And when I think about Remembrance Day, I think I think I think about the people who laid down their lives for Canada and for the rest of us so that we can be free. And as I said, throughout this program, we'll be doing that with different Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Um, let's go uh, back down to, uh, to Hannah Thibodeau, who has with her the uh, Chief of the Defence Staff, uh, General Jonathan Vance. Hannah. Thank you, Peter. As you mentioned, I'm joined by General Jonathan Vance. Always a pleasure to speak with you on Remembrance Day. An important day for you because you were just saying that you remember the people that you lost as well on this day, and that's one of the big things for you today. It is. Uh, I think that all of us in uniform have a great connection to our history and our past uh, in the armed forces. And so we remember that whole sweep of history, uh, that which made us the armed forces we are today. But I, I think it's particularly poignant uh, that we've uh, served with people who, and that we've lost recently. And so today I, I try to remember everybody, but I certainly have those who were close to me. And uh, uh, I think of our Silver Cross mother uh, today, whose son served in Afghanistan and was wounded and, and died from his wounds. Uh, so a very poignant day, uh, but also a, a great day for all of us to, to ponder the, the service and sacrifice that... that has been made and continues to be made. And it's not just in wars as well. We also have a lot of peacekeepers. We know now that the peacekeeping mission will be for three years. When you look forward to them and the peacekeepers, we don't know exactly where they're going. What type of uh, thoughts do you have for the peacekeepers out there as well? Well, you know, the being in the armed forces uh, allows you to uh, conduct a range of operations uh, for the country. Uh, from humanitarian all the way through to conducting combat operations. It's a great thing uh, that uh, Canada is able to put its military uh, to good purpose, good use around the world, uh, to try and bring better conditions for those who are in trouble or in need. And so as we ponder the planning for the, the upcoming missions, and remember we're all over the world right now uh, trying to, to do good work for the country, to do good work for our allies, uh, to bring a, a, a better condition around uh, for, for people uh, around the world. Uh, peace support operations are going to be very important. Um, I'd like to, to think that some of it will aid in preventing future conflict uh, and uh, making things better uh, in, in countries that desperately need, it, need us. General Jonathan Vance, I want to thank you for your service and thank you for your time today. Thanks, Hannah. All the best. Thank you. Peter. All right, Hannah, thank you. And uh, General Vance got to be one of the few people here uh, today who's not wearing a coat, at least not yet. And it's it's chilly. It's, uh, as we said, it's just over the zero mark, about three degrees here in Ottawa, and very windy. Uh, nevertheless, big crowds expected once again, and already an hour away from the, uh, the actual ceremony, there are many thousands here. I want to pick up uh, with Rosie on, on the 
the, this issue of the new peacekeeping mission that's going to be in Africa. Um, and we're starting to get a sense from the government uh, that this, while they call it a peacekeeping mission, and it will be, is not without risk. Rosie. Yeah, I mean, I guess the news today, as Hannah alluded to, is that it will be a commitment of three years, although re-examined each year to see whether it still makes sense. But it's certainly uh, in an interview with the Toronto Star today, and, and, and in comments that he's made to me as well, the Minister of National Defence, Harjit Sajjan, is talking about the increased risk of this kind of mission. Remember, it's about 600 troops, so not a huge contingent. They are expected to be spread out over various African countries. He just got back from a fact-finding mission to Mali uh, and Senegal. Mali certainly comes with a very heavy risk. I think there have been more than 100 deaths there, uh, according to the United Nations, it related to that peacekeeping mission since 2013. So they, I think, are trying to set the stage here a little bit to try and prepare Canadians for the fact that this peacekeeping mission, it's not just about going in and protecting people, but potentially also about trying to fight radicalization, fight terrorists in these countries. Um, there will be, yes, some capacity building, and by that I mean helping people. There will be a big development component. The Minister of International Development was on that fact-finding mission, too, and, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs is in Africa right now, uh, looking at different countries as well. So it, it will be a, a broad mission, but I, I think that they are definitely trying to prepare Canadians for the fact that those 600 soldiers who are going to be sent, we still don't know exactly where, will be putting their lives in danger and will be part of a very robust UN peacekeeping mission. So the word peacekeeping may be a little bit misleading in, in this instance. All right, Rosie, thank you. My name is Austin Iwining, and I remember my grandmother because she fought in World War II, and uh, she passed away a couple years ago. I'm from Vancouver, but I'm also from France, and I remember our veterans because they have free my country. You know, we've been talking already in this program about the different VIPs who will be here, the Governor General, the Prime Minister, you saw the Chief of the Defence Staff, there will be many others as well. The Premier of Newfoundland will be here in a few moments, so we'll explain to you why on that in a few moments' time. But the real VIPs are none of them. The real VIP, VIPs are the, are the veterans. Those are the people who are being uh, remembered today, uh, those who sacrificed their lives and those who sacrificed their time through the work they've done in, in past conflicts and assignments uh, over the many years. Um, there have been some pretty special people we've met here over time. Hannah Thibodeau has a story of one of them. Hello, my name is Ellen Blanche Landry Bennett. I am 94 years old. We have stickers. You like those? They make such a big fuss when, when they see uh, uh, me sitting with my medals. They say, oh my God, those medals are beautiful. You know, were you in the war? And I say, mm-hmm, I was. When I was uh, going on 19 years old, I joined the Canadian Women's Army Corps in Summerside PEI. And I said, oh, I wouldn't mind being a telephone operator. And that's what I became. Little girl from PEI, posted to Halifax, Nova Scotia. First time off the island, yeah, mm-hmm. It was the military switchboard. The number was 319181. Still remember that. There were 16 ladies and I can name them all. Sergeant Reed, Flora Leslie, Din McDougall, if I got 16 yet. The girls, the women who joined the forces, we were not really appreciated until, I'm gonna say the last 20 years, and it was because a few of us who have a lot to say and don't mind saying it, just um, just said, hey, you know what? We did something, and it's about time that somebody recognized this.
when they play the last polls, I get very choked up. And to me, it all comes back in a flash. It's never going to go away. It's with me forever. You have to remember that the youngest one of World War II has got to be 91, 92. The next year, there's going to be fewer and fewer and fewer from now on. My one wish is that I do get back on the hill, maybe next year when I'm 95. Blind is a pretty special person. I've met her a couple of times here. Hannah brought her over at, at one point to, uh, to introduce us. And we've corresponded over time in, uh, by mail. Uh, we miss you this year, Blanche, but we know you'll be with us here next year. Uh, back with Brian Stewart. You know, Brian, you were listening to General Vance talk about the upcoming peacekeeping mission, in, uh, which is going to be in Africa, and the and the risks involved, as, as Rosie said. Your thoughts on that? Well, it's important to note that the, the United Nations has been desperately calling on the rich nations of the world to return to peacekeeping, which they have really, uh, in many cases, run down in recent years. This is a, a desperate need in the world, and Canada's not the only one going back in. The British are going back in. Germans are going in. A lot more of the richer nations are realizing that you don't really have an option. You can't sit out in a world where there are 50 failed states, where there's so much violence, and just stay home. So we have to send, we feel we have to send our troops, and those missions will not be short. They will be long, and they will not be risk-free. They will be very risky, not only for physical casualties, but obviously for emotional ones as well. We, we should, when we remember, Two years ago, we mentioned, we celebrated, not we remembered the start of this First World War. Mm. We're only two years through that four year span right. of First World War memories, still to come, Vimy and Passchendaele and the end of the war. This reminds us how long these commitments are, how, how dangerous they are, but how, when we send soldiers off on these missions, we do owe them a perpetual. Uh, a guarantee that we won't forget this because it is such a difficult mission. You know, when you talk about some of those names that ring out from the First World War, the, um, as you said, Vimy and Passchendaele yet to come, one of the ones that we just passed, one of the major anniversaries that we just passed was especially for Newfoundland, the name of the town Beaumont Hamill. Why does that name ring so important for Newfoundlanders, and why will it be a part of this day again? Here's why. Watch this. When Britain declared war on Germany in August 1914, Newfoundland was a British colony. It had no army, not even a militia. But when the call went out to help the empire, the island lads responded. The 1st Newfoundland Regiment was born, its ranks filled with boys ready to shoulder the burdens of men. By the spring of 1916, they were in France, and on July 1st, Allied forces launched a major offensive to break Germany's western lines. The Battle of the Somme had begun. At 9.15, the Newfoundland Regiment went over the top near the town of Beaumont Hamel. But the German forces were well positioned and well armed. The Allies were slaughtered. In a single morning, 50,000 British troops died. The Newfoundland Regiment was decimated. 233 killed, 386 wounded. At roll call, only 68 men answered their names. It was a defining moment for the people of Newfoundland, a symbol of valor and the terrible sacrifices of war. Beaumont Hamill, never forgotten, 100 years on. And 100 years on, the Premier of Newfoundland today, 
is uh, with Hannah Thibodeau just here at the National War Memorial. Hannah. Thanks, Peter. As you say, we have the marching bands going by right now, so we're getting that treat. And I'm joined by the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, Dwight Ball. So let's talk about the importance of Newfoundland soldiers. Well, the importance is really, it's really a long list and the importance of what our soldiers have done, not just at Beaumont Hamel, but it was a big year with the under anniversary, of course, and the significant losses that we had on July 1st in 1916. But it, the story didn't end there. In just a few months after that, they went on to fight courageously in other battles and had distinguished careers and made significant impacts in uh, really just they answered the call and in some cases the only North American troops that participated in some of the earlier battles. Now why do you think that is that they were answering that call? It's who, it's who they were. They were young soldiers from small communities across the province and they went to places that they did not, that they never heard of before. But it's who Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are and went on to shape uh, the future of our province. But it's one of courage and honor and distinction, as I said. But it's a very proud moment in our history coming off of some significant losses. Now, this is your first Remembrance Day at the National War Memorial. And you were saying the first time for a Newfoundland premier? Yeah, someone was telling me as I left this week that. Uh, they had, not, they had not known of any Newfoundland Premier to participate, but this being a very special year because of the 100th anniversary of Beaumont Animal, I thought it was appropriate for us to be here. There's significant uh, numbers and ceremonies that happen around our province today, and there will be big numbers, as we see here in, in Ottawa, but big numbers all across Newfoundland and Labrador. Premier Ball, I want to thank you and welcome you to your first service here yeah, at the was, National War Memorial. It's great to be here. It's a great day. Peter. All right, Anna, thank you. My name is Nicole and certainly I wear a poppy for remembrance because I think the soldiers that fought for our freedoms and the, the, the life that we get to live is very, very, very important. I remember my friends that didn't come home and also the friends that went over and came back and uh, have put their lives on the line for the rest of us. here now in the nation's capital, the National War Memorial, the positioning now going on with the various groups, various guards of honor that will be positioned, the veterans who are all here in their numbers. You know, the average age of the Second World War veterans now, Brian, 92. 92. Well, I remember as a child, there were older brothers and uncles. Yeah. They were around at parties and barbecues. And now they're very old men. Yeah. And on this day, that's what it's all about. It's, uh, it's remembering these men and women uh, who took part in past assignments that the Canadian government had given them, whether they were in deep in conflict or deep into peacekeeping uh, in different parts of the world. And of course, as you said earlier, we have so many of the veterans now from Afghanistan who are with us and from uh, the peacekeeping missions with their own memories, very heavy memories at times. And that is a, you know, it has been an issue for a hundred years, the post-war effect on, on veterans from the Boer War, the First World War, the Second World War. It, it's gone from being called shell shock and in a certain sense being uh, you know, suggested that these people just didn't have the, the nerve to handle the situations they were in to a much different understanding we and appreciation of what We really, what really didn't really even begin on. to get a handle on it until about 10 years ago, which is surprising. And, I, and, and many of the experts don't think we're there yet, that beyond something like PTSD, there's another gray area that affects all those, maybe particularly peacekeepers of the Afghanistan uh, mission, where so many awful things are seen, things done to civilians at the Soldiers can't protect the civilians. Mm -hmm. they do, people come back shocked. We one thinks of General Romeo Dallaire, right. of Rwanda, fame, of course, who has for all the years since Rwanda fought his own struggles with mental mental problems. And so many of the, those who go abroad in these missions today see things and have to deal with things that. Uh, uh, our, the mind just really can't even grasp. Nightmares can't even grasp them fully. 
And the First World War was more soldiers against soldiers. Second World War, to an extent, still it was armies against armies. Now, so often, uh, our troops, uh, foreign troops, uh, have to deal with uh, the, the, the civilian horrors that surround them. Um, one of the main participants on uh, Remembrance Day every year is the Silver Cross Mother. Uh, this is someone designated uh, by the country to be representative of really all parents who have lost um, a child through the sacrifices of, of war. This year's Silver Cross Mother uh, is Colleen Fitzpatrick from Prince George, British Columbia. She lost her son Darren in 2010 after he was wounded on patrol in Afghanistan. He had stepped on an IED. We want you to meet Colleen Fitzpatrick. I don't go to the cemetery often. Uh, for me, it's a place of finality. And so I like to go to places that are positive, where I can feel Darren's presence. The cabin was his favorite place on earth, our family cabin. Darren loved his family. He was extremely close to his two brothers and his cousins. He had many, many cousins, and he spent every summer at the family cabin. I feel Darren's presence, for sure. I know he's there, that's his happy place, and I know that he's there with us. He's there in the summer. Uh, yeah, I just sit and reflect and think of him and know, know he's there. Shortly after high school graduation, he advised us that he had decided he was going to sign up for the military. It was a bit of a surprise because we hadn't heard it before. But once we reflected and thought back, I wasn't surprised. Um, knowing who Darren is and his character, I could see him wanting to step forward and do things that would have impact. He was a very giving soul, um, appreciated what life had to offer and wanted to share that with others. So he was the first one to stand up and offer help, the first person to look to someone that in some ways he can offer of himself. I was scared and he told us there was no doubt. Um, I was a bit nervous, but uh, I also wanted to support him. As I said, Darren was a redhead, strong-willed. There was no way we were gonna change his mind regardless. Darren was injured in the field, and uh, they managed to stabilize him enough to fly him to the Kandahar Hospital. From that point, they flew him to Langdul, uh, where Jim and I met him there. When Darren awoke, um, his only request was that he come home to Canada. Take me home, yeah. He wanted to be home with his his family, yeah. That was probably the toughest time. Every day was literally hour by hour, um, but I wouldn't have given those up for anything. Those were probably the most precious times that we had. I think of the mothers and the parents that did not have that opportunity, and I realize that we're blessed. All of our families of uh, Silver Cross moms have lost. It became really obviously very significant to me after the loss of Darren. And in reflection, I look back and I think of all the mothers and the families that have lost their loved ones. And I realize how inspirational they are. And I'm humbled. Yeah, I'm proud to be part of that. Every summer, the dock is launched into the lake uh, by his younger cousins, and every summer, a flag is erected in his honor. I love to go to the park, and I love to spend time there because that's where youth are having fun. They're enjoying their time. They're hanging out with their friends, and that's what Darren was all about, hanging out with your buddies, enjoying your time together, uh, living life to the fullest. That was where Darren would be most happy. Well, I feel blessed that we had Darren in our lives for 21 years. He's a very special person. And yeah, I'm just really joyful that we had that time together. You have to look at life in a positive, fulfilling way. And that was Darren. That was
That's one of the lessons we learned from him. This year's Silver Cross mother, Colleen Fitzpatrick, she'll be here uh, at the National War Memorial. She'll be arriving in about 10 or 15 minutes and, of course, will play a lead role in the ceremony which is about to take place. Um, I want to go back down and bring Hannah back into the uh, story again because she has a special guest, the Minister of Veterans Affairs, Kent Hare. Thank you, Peter. I was just chatting with the Minister of Veterans Affairs, Kent Hare, a few moments ago. He was telling me it's been a steep learning curve for him for the past year as the new Minister of Veterans Affairs. Uh, what's been the most poignant thing for you in the past year? That we, uh, as a nation, recognize the service and sacrifice of the 2.3 million Canadians who have served in our armed forces since Confederation. And also, not only them, but their families. Because each and every one of them have a family member that goes along with them on their journey from uh, basic training through to their service. And honoring those contributions is truly important to me, as well as ensuring we deliver the best services we can to see them succeed. And you were in Beaumont ML as well? Yes. To go back to uh, Beaumont Hamel to uh, see the uh, brave uh, Newfoundlanders and the journey they went on was truly an amazing thing. Seeing the trenches, the, the close battle, the uh, significance of what they went through. Really an experience that I will remember the rest of my life. It was a very poignant experience for the minister. We can hear the band going right behind him, very loud, but very enjoyable. And just finally, for you at home as well, uh, in Calgary Centre, you had a neat little school. They're called Western Canada High School. I look back at what I was doing in high school, playing hockey, chasing the odd love interest, having a lot of fun, even doing a tad bit of homework. But there were 50 young men, some as young as 15, who left high school to go serve our nation in World War I, in those trenches, in the snowy cold. Buddies uh, passing away beside of them, some of them paying the ultimate sacrifice. When I compare their sacrifice and service to what I was doing in high school, it pales in significance. Veterans Affairs Minister Kent Hare, I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. Peter. All right, Anna, thank you. And uh, for those who are wondering, the, the bands and the various uh, uh, honor guards are forming in the background for the official ceremonies. And of course, when those begin, we will be taking them without commentary to allow you to hear all the um, the special moments, the pomp, the pageantry, the remembrance uh, throughout this next hour or so. That is still a few minutes away from beginning. There is kind of positioning going on here right now. Um, I want to bring Rosie back in for, uh, for a second because the, the veterans issue, which Kent Hare is responsible for, is one that uh, continually pops up. Uh, in Parliament as a, one of deep concern to a lot of people and about the way veterans are looked after and, and handled in this country. What's the latest on that? Well, I mean, there have been some uh, some changes that have been made since this government came into power, uh, you know, significantly and perhaps symbolically. The Prime Minister yesterday was in Sydney, Nova Scotia, reopening one of those nine veterans' offices that were closed under the previous government. That was one of their promises, that they wanted those offices to be open so people could access services easily. And they, they put a few other things in the budget um, last year, with, you know, whether it be around um, the impairment allowance or increasing disability al allowances as well for veterans, things that actually don't go into effect until this spring. But there is still a problem, I, I think everyone would agree, with the amount of paperwork and red tape that veterans have to go through to get the things that they need. Uh, they put 250 more frontline workers in place to try and help them. It has made some difference, but probably not enough. And you mentioned Romeo Dallaire earlier. Well, he's one of the people who actually believes that veterans affairs and national defense should be working in the, under the same department, and that that would ease the transition a little bit from people who are going from active duty to veterans. So it, it is a complicated file. They've made a little headway, but probably not as much as most veterans would like. All right. Rosie, thank you. Hi, my name is Carlos Foyne from Callowit, and I'd like to remember my great uncle Moses Grant, who served in World War I. I'm going to be remembering my grandfather this Remembrance Day. He served in the Korean War. 
I'll be thinking about my grandfather, Ser Sergeant John Curry, who uh, fought at the Battle of the Somme in 1916 with the Lothian and Border Horse Light Infantry. As we get ready for the arrival of the various dignitaries, including the Governor General and the Prime Minister, in the next few minutes, we want to tell you another one of those stories we promised you of. And I don't think I have to say much about this. A couple of things. Havard Gould will tell the story, and it's about a young man and a canoe. Watch this. He was a 17-year-old who loved canoeing, went to war, and never came back. Now, almost a century later, his old canoe has drifted back to where he spent his summers. The young man who paddled the canoe was Bob Hamilton, a member of a prominent Canadian family, and his mysterious disappearance haunted his family. He was wounded in August of 1918, but he was alive and well away from the action, being transferred between medical facilities when he vanished. For years, the family searched for him, asking for help from officials and seeking soldiers who might have seen him even traveling to France. But there was never anything more about the young man who loved paddling. And after a while, one of Bob's brothers took the canoe to Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Eventually, it was given to another family, the Fountains. It survived many adventures, including a fire, painted red in an attempt to stop leaks. But Bruce Fountain says his family always called it the Bob Hamilton canoe in honor of the lost soldier. And when Rock took hold of the canoe, he decided he couldn't let the last tangible link to the young man fade away. Didn't know I was doing it for Bob. But I think we did. It took years. Dana Fountain, Bruce's son, eventually took over the restoration project. Dana became fascinated with Bob Hamilton and the mystery, finding dozens of military records about him online. When you have that level of information, it really does connect to the person in a way that family oral folklore doesn't. Dana couldn't find out what happened to Bob Hamilton, but he did put the now gleaming canoe back in the water. This was where Bob paddled the canoe, and now to have it be on the water again, I think is a, a very serendipitous moment. And by sheer coincidence, Dana now stores it at a cottage that is on the Lake of Bays, where Bob and the rest of the Hamilton family a century ago spent their summers. The owner died in the war, the First World War. Oh, wow. Dana makes sure everyone who sees it learns something about the young soldier who had the canoe first. And it's been in my family since the 1920s or 30s or so. From a professional the restoration has really even impressed a master canoe builder in the area, Jack Hurley. This passes anything I've ever done. Wow, this is spectacular work. Now, on the water, Bob Hamilton's memory is never far away. The canoe came back, Bob did not come back. Well, I just am a custodian of it. With the canoe restored and returned, the soldier who vanished 98 years ago now seems a little less lost, a little less forgotten. Havard Gould, CBC News, Lake of Bays, Ontario. I love that story. It's, uh, you know, it, it says a lot about that young fellow, says a lot about our country, and it says a lot about those who have made the decision to, you know, uh, bring that canoe back to the life it had 100 years ago. Brian, the other thing that story is about is about young men who volunteered, volunteered being the key word. This is one of the great and incredible Canadian stories that of all the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of young Canadian, mainly men, who went off to war, and women too, 
uh, they volunteered. They, they served in, say, the first, the two worst wars in all of history, the First and Second World War. All, all of those soldiers, except for a very small sliver at the end of the Second World War, had volunteered. They had given up jobs. They had given up uh, families and friends and, and dates and wives, spouses. They had gone overseas. They had, they had taken, they had left this country, and in so many of their letters and diaries is a reflection. I wonder how things are back on the old dock, or how are things back in the old street? How are things with the old gang? What an enormous, extraordinary sacrifice that was to take. And so many did it in a small country. Yeah. And, you know, in the way that so many of them remembered their country, even the time I remember being in the tunnels below Vimy Ridge and seeing one fellow from Ontario who'd scratched his name into the chalk tunnels and had drawn beneath it a canoe. Because that was his memory. That was his, his sign of his home. Right. It could have been a, a baseball team or a sure. hockey team. Yeah. They, they left it all behind. And uh, for years, they would r reflect back upon how beautiful Canada seemed to them now that they were in Flanders or wherever they were, and yeah. how one day they hoped to get back to that. All right. Um, you met Blanche a little while ago, uh, a story of, uh, uh, of somebody Hannah had met a couple of years ago, and who we hope will be back here uh, one more time. Today, she's with somebody new, Hannah. Thank you very much, Peter. This is my favorite part, is I get to talk with veterans who are here. This is a Korean veteran, uh, Mr. McCarthy, Vincent McCarthy. Now, you served in the Korean War. Uh, now, explain to me, it took you six weeks to get from Halifax to get there, and then what did you do? And then we landed in uh, just outside Tokyo, and, and uh, we spent our time there just a few days, and then from there we had to go to Sasebo, which is the southern part of Japan, the naval base there, and we get our orders from there, take off, and away it, we go. <laughs> it, away you go, yeah. and you were in charge on your ship of going after trains. Yeah, it was a big job. It was a very big job, and it was scary at times, too. Scary at times, because, uh, of course, we had our radar on our ship, too, to pick up the, the, the trains coming down the coast, and our job was there. We only had so many minutes to get the train because it was hiding underneath the tunnel again. Right. And uh, we had to dock these trains there. Now, this is your first time here this year. Why is it so important to be here? Oh, well, you know, it's I'm getting older, and it's nice to try to remember my veterans. My brother served in the Second World War. He was in the Army. And, you know, I like, and he's still living. He's 96, or 94, I should say. He's an older. Older than I am, my oldest brother. Well, I, I want to thank you and your brother for your service, and thank you for your time today. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Peter. All right, Hannah, thank you. This monument represents a simple truth. They died so that we could be free. Free to pursue our dreams. Free to succeed or to fail and try again. Free to speak, to celebrate, to protest. Free to choose our leaders. Free to love whomever we want. Free to debate and refine our rights. We lost so many to the horrors of war. Just months away from celebrating 150 years of Canada, we pause to remember those who made our Canada possible. And here we are at the National War Memorial in Ottawa. In the next few moments, we expect the arrivals to take uh, place. And those are the arrivals, of course, of the various dignitaries from the Governor General and his wife, David, and Sharon Johnston, uh, both of whom will be in uniform today. And it'll be interesting to see that because when the Governor General became the Governor General, he was unsure whether he would ever wear a uniform as the commander-in-chief of Canada's Armed Forces uh, because he'd never been in the military. But he got over that fairly quickly. He was convinced by the military itself that he should be in uniform. And so he will be today in his... He can wear the uniform of any of the services. Today he'll be wearing the uniform of the Royal Canadian Air Force. 
And Sharon Johnston, who is now an honorary captain in the Royal Canadian Navy, will be wearing a naval uniform. And I think that's the first time uh, we've ever seen both the Gigi and his or her spouse in uniform. So there was uh, an incident we're told here just a few moments ago because of the high wind and it is you know it's very windy as you can tell just watching people's scarves there the a piece of scaffolding fell down a couple of people I believe were slightly injured. The first of the uh, motorcades arriving now first up will be the uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and his wife uh, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau. six-car motorcade uh, for the Prime Minister. The security has changed things so much here over the years. It used to be two, three. Uh, it ballooned up sometimes to significantly more than this, but uh, today it's a, a six-car motorcade for the Prime Minister. And uh, there he is. Sophie Gregoire Trudeau met by the representatives of the Royal Canadian Legion it's the Prime Minister's second Remembrance Day services here in Ottawa Vance again. And there's your Veterans Affairs Minister, Kent Hare, who I was just talking to a few moments ago. And just to give you a heads up, a number of things happen as they always do uh, at this time. The Silver Cross Mother will be next arriving, and then the Governor General. And then we get into the formal proceedings that we will stop our commentary and allow it all to unfold uh, over, uh, over the air without uh, needed commentary. But what you should know ahead of time uh, is there will be uh, 21 gun salute. So you will be hearing the uh, by town gunners, as they're called, uh, from Ottawa, who will be. Uh, firing the salutes, sometimes uh, startle a few people. Motorcade just arriving, which usually signals the, uh, the next limousine arrivals to take place in the next few minutes. You can see what I mean about the temperature. <laughs> Contrast to last year, which was a you know quite quite a warm day. And but the National Silver Cross Mother is arriving. Mrs. Colleen Fitzpatrick of Prince George, British Columbia, is the mother of the late Corporal Darren Fitzpatrick, who was mortally wounded after stepping on an improvised explosive device while on patrol in the Zahari District near Kandahar City, Afghanistan, on March 6, 2010. He was a member of the 3rd Battalion, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, based in Edmonton, Alberta. Mrs. Fitzpatrick is accompanied by her husband, Jim. And there you heard the uh, MC for the day giving the facts about Colleen Fitzpatrick and her son, Darren, who died two weeks after stepping on an IED in Afghanistan near Kandahar. Was able to get home as part of the process of attempted recovery. He took many blood transfusions during that time. And as a result of that, Colleen Fitzpatrick now is a dedicated worker on the and advocate on the issue of blood donation.
she meets the Prime Minister. And Sophie Gregoire should go. one of the um, the great fears of some that in our remembrance we tend have already tended to forget those veterans of Afghanistan thousands of them who served in Afghanistan and it's moments like this that that help change yes, very much Peter we haven't discussed Afghanistan nearly as much in recent years. It's sort of fading a little bit from our consciousness. We have to remember it more clearly. It's the Governor General arriving now. And as we mentioned, David Johnston will be in RCAF uniform. And his wife, who was made an honorary captain in the Royal Canadian Navy, will be wearing the RCN uniform. Again, more signs, Peter, that Remembrance Day seems to be growing in size and scale to some extent in recent years. The uniforms, the determination to, to, to remember properly. If anything, it seems to be a bit larger than it seemed to be when we were younger reporters covering this back in, say, the 1980s. Right. You know, I met a couple of veterans last night uh, in the hotel lobby um, who said they were at this ceremony in the 1980s, at one point in the 1980s, where they got pelted with eggs by the crowd. You know, we're protesting whatever the issues were in, in the mid-1980s. Right. And the crowd was small and, uh, and as we said, not all uh, very happy. First of the royal salutes for the Governor General. Johnston, Sharon Johnston, the Governor General and his wife are now meeting some of those various representatives of Canadian society who will be taking part in the Remembrance Day ceremony in these next few minutes. Everybody in, in position and a couple of minutes early this year, which uh, will make the organizers happy because they start fretting. <laughs> when people arrive late. Uh, you know, a number of things will happen before the two minutes of silence, as you know, including a fly pass, which will take place. Part of the Junior Rangers from Canada's north. Cadets. There's so many Canadians. The Prime Minister would have been taken to his first Remembrance Day by his family. So all of us sort of remember being taken to our first one or watching on television our first one. I'm sure Trudeau had exactly the same experience with his father. Governor General, nearing the end of uh, his term, it was extended by Prime Minister Harper uh, last year with an election 
uh, about to happen. And so it's expected within the next year the Governor General uh, will come to the end of his term and a new Governor General will be appointed in the, the normal Ottawa speculation game of who that person may be <laughs> is already uh, underway. Nothing firm yet on that. Everyone lining up in position, the positions they will have for the official part of the ceremony. Each will lay a wreath at the memorial. There will be prayers offered. And Ottawa's Children's Choir will be singing as well. Famous for their part on this day. the Central Band of the Canadian Armed Forces and the Ottawa Children's Choir in the singing of O Canada. Mesdames et Messieurs, veuillez vous lever et s'il vous plaît vous joindre à la musique centrale des Forces armées canadiennes et au cœur des enfants d'Ottawa pour le O Canada.
condemn and at the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them comme nous qui leur avons servécu. Ils ne connaîtront jamais l'outrage ni les trois them, des années. Adviendra l'heure du trépassement et ils s'en auront et nous nous souviendrons d'eux. Un jour de l'heure, Yahrane, Yachta hoki stok hane, nene yung watataro, nene ayung wak stahane, yachta to hoti ni guharo, juniori, ongarapone, danone or hogene, yeniti yahane, yachta, yeti ni gurha, le to. For some, this is a time of prayer. For others, it is a time of quiet contemplation. Whichever this time is for you, may we turn our thoughts together now to why it is that we are gathered here. Que ces mots que je prononcerai that, uh, these words vous aide à vous souvenir help you to remember chacun et chacune à votre manière every one of you in your own way let us pray prions god creator of all as we stand here in this hallowed place of remembrance our hearts bear the weight of grief and pain caused by the wars we remember from years gone by and by those that still rage across our world today. D'un océan à l'autre, nous provenons de différents horizons, de différentes confessions religieuses et traditions. Mais nous sommes avant tout unis But we are first and foremost un united in our duty to remember. We give thanks for the men and women of every generation who have served this nation at sea, on the land, and in the skies. Their names are etched on our hearts, on stone and bronze on faded plaques in schools and places of worship, in wooden frames in town halls, on monuments in quiet parks. Today, we do not pass them by. Today, we stop, we pause, and we remember them. 
Nous nous rappelons de tous ceux et celles qui portent en eux les cicatrices de la guerre, dans leur corps, dans leurs leur corps, dans leurs corps, dans leurs âmes, ou dans leurs âmes. Nous nous souvenons de tous ceux We et celles dont la vie a été brisée whose, uh, life was par ce qu'ils ont vu ou fait ou ce dont ils ont été témoins tout en sachant qu'ils étaient impuissants à changer le cours des choses. Nous nous grievons que pour certains, ils n'ont pas eu d'autre option que de finir leurs vies rather than continue to struggle with the deep pain that they feel. Donne-nous de voir parmi nous ceux et celles qui souffrent en silence. We must help those who suffer in silence. la volonté de les soutenir. They give us the desire to help them with their effort to find healing. Donne-nous la force de Give us the strength to reassure them through our words and our actions. We pray for Her Majesty the Queen, our Governor General, and our Prime Minister, our Chief Justice, and for the Ministers of National Defense and Veterans Affairs. We pray for the Chief of Defense Staff and all others who serve in positions of authority that they may have the wisdom and the courage required to give leadership in these challenging times. Dieu miséricordieux, Dieu oh, de merciful paix, God, God of peace, enfin we are pr praying for Puissions ourselves. Lieu, Let us leave this place bon determined to do all we can flambeau, to receive the torch, the torch that we will pass on to those who came before jour, us. May we, every day, work towards reconciliation and understanding and peace within our families and in our communities. May we continue to build a nation where our differences are embraced as strength, where our workplaces are free from harassment and discrimination and where we are resolved to seek the well-being of all peoples who make this land home, as well as all those who have made this land both home and place of refuge. Keep ever before us the dream of a world in which war will become just a faded memory that the sacrifices we have remembered today may not have been made in vain, so that the extraordinary price paid in flesh and blood may finally bring about that day when all people of every nation might enjoy the peace and freedom that you wish for all creation. Nous te le demandons. This is what we ask of you, dear Lord. Madame et Messieurs, veuillez vous asseoir. Please be seated. The Vice Regal Party will now begin placing their wreaths. Les membres du cortège vice-royal déposeront maintenant leur couronne.
So what happens now is the various members of the diplomatic corps, you can see the Embassy of Mexico now, um, sending its representatives up, and in some cases the ambassadors from various countries who are stationed here in Ottawa as the representatives from their world to ours. They each lay wreaths as well, but there are many different groups here once the diplomatic corps is finished who will be laying wreaths and we'll keep our eye on that as the official part of the program continues and the beautiful sound of the Ottawa Children's Choir in the background.
Nous sommes ici sur cet emplacement sacré. We are here in this sacred place to remember. We are gathered in this sacred space, sanctified via remembrance and eternally sanctified by the precious blood spilled here. What does it mean to remember? To remember meaningfully is to express our gratitude, not meekly, rather energetically, not generically, rather more specifically. We are here to remember to extol our veterans past and present. Please ring out your bravo, the universal language of gratitude to the liberating Allied forces in World War II, as we acknowledge the enormous gratitude we owe to our dear veterans. We will shout out 10 bravos. For the supreme sacrifice so many beloved Canadians made and were ready to make on land, in the air, at sea, the dead, the wounded, the survivors, the war bereaved, men and women, Anglophones, Francophones, First Nation members, people of many ethnic and religious communities, we say together, bravo, for putting their lives on hold and at risk in order to eliminate tyranny and defend liberty, younger veterans and older veterans who meet today in mutual respect and admiration as partners in the battle against evil, we say together, Bravo for fighting our fight to assure, free, to assure freedom and dignity for everyone, deserving to be celebrated, applauded, and eternally appreciated as authentic heroes. We say together, bravo for their bravery, their dignity, their selflessness, their embrace of Canada, their devotion to global freedom and peacekeeping that defines them. We say together, bravo for the profound, in the profound words of Romeo Dallaire, for carrying our moral norms into immoral situations. We say together, bravo, for knowing that even if they return whole in body, they will still be confronted with looming issues such as PTSD, yet still risking their future on our behalf. We say together, bravo, for being the unifying inspiration of selflessness and dedication, reminding us of what being Canadian is all about. We say together, bravo. For those who, may those who died be remembered lovingly. May those who were injured be healed in body and spirit. May those who served and continue to serve live out their lives in a world free of terror and suffused with tranquility. The type of world they fought to create and to preserve and for which we say together, bravo. How do we continually say thank you to our veterans? By embracing them, by hugging them, by expressing our appreciation to every veteran we meet in all places and at all times. By teaching our children how much in their debt we always will be. And by exclaiming in unison for them to hear, bravo. Let us continue to make Canada worthy of their dedication and sacrifice, a country in which respect, harmony, inclusion, responsibility, and kindness fill the air, a country which reflects the profundity of our saying together, bravo. God bless our veterans. God bless our troops. God bless all those who stand on guard. Peace champions all here and abroad. God bless Canada. Amen. Remember, stay prayed. Attention. Veuillez vous lever. For God save the Queen. Que Dieu protège la reine.
Veuillez vous asseoir. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the march off will soon commence with our veterans leading the parade, followed by the Royal Military College of Canada, the members of the Royal Canadian Navy, the Canadian Army, and the Royal Canadian Air Force, followed by HMCS Carleton, the Governor General's Foot Guards, Cameron Highlanders of Ottawa, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, cadets from the Navy, Army and Air Cadet organizations, as well as the Navy League Cadets of Canada, followed by the 30th Field Regiment Royal Canadian Artillery. Mesdames et Messieurs, le défilé de sortie avec les vétérans en tête débutera sous peu, suivi par le Collège militaire royal du Canada, les membres de la Marine royale du Canada, de l'Armée canadienne et de l'Aviation royale du Canada. HMCS Carleton, the Governor General's Foot Guards, the Cameron Highlanders d'Ottawa, the Gendarmerie Royale du Canada, the Cadets de la Marine, de l'Armée et de l'Air, ainsi que les Cadets de la Ligue Navale du Canada. Come by to meet and greet some of the veterans. Silver Cross Mother, Colleen Fitzpatrick. So the dignitaries now, especially the GG, heading towards that area where the kind of a saluting base for the parade that is about to take place. It often happens. Uh, we've been getting a few calls and inquiries about the Union Jack that flies, as you see it prominently in that shot. Uh, and that is simply because the Canadian forces in those first couple of conflicts, the Boer War, the First World War, uh, flew under the Union Jack. So many of the Canadians who died in those conflicts died beneath that flag. And if you tune a little late and wondering who is that person with the Governor General in the naval uniform, that's the Governor General's wife, Sharon Johnston, who was made just this past summer, in June I think it was, uh, an honorary captain with the Royal Canadian Navy. And she then has the right to wear that uniform, as does the Governor General, as the Commander in Chief of Canadian Forces. Many of the veterans now moving into position as well. They will be marching. And they're probably happy to at this hour after having <laughs> stood there for the last hour in the. It's cold. It, it, it is chilly. Oh, it's boy. a chilly day here in, uh, in Ottawa and windy too. Um, quite windy at times when it's uh, gusting. So this gives them a chance to move around a little bit and get warm. But you heard the lineup of the different uh, organizations that will be in the parade and the different branches of the Canadian Forces. A little cool, cool, that's right. Yeah. Well, it's called the cool, Governor General. Everyone here can sympathize with him. I, I must say, I'm incredibly impressed by the fortitude of the veterans to have uh, been solidly sitting or standing yeah. in uh, this very, very, very brisk wind and uh, chill wind. But they, uh, they are tough. They are a tough breed. They're tough, and so is a very appreciative crowd, um, given these conditions. You know, many people were wondering just how many would turn up today, but they're, you know, we haven't had an estimate yet from the Ottawa police, but it looks like it's at least in the kind of 15 to 20,000 range when you look down uh, Elgin Street here in Ottawa and along Wellington Street, which is kind of the corners of where the National War Memorial is. Uh, they're lined all along there uh, to witness the ceremony that took place and also to applaud as they're doing now as the veterans go by. These guys always, uh, well, we just pass them there in their 
kind of leather biker jackets. The first year they turned up, people weren't exactly who are these guys? What are they doing here? But it is a uh, it is a veterans group, and uh, they have a very distinctive style. As do the Mounties, of course. And we should, I guess, mention too that, of course, veterans are out today all over Canada at various monuments and, and small gatherings, or or did on the weekend close to. Uh, uh, it, it's something they uh, that takes place in a great many communities in the country. That gives you a sense of the wind. Yeah. They're just lined up, getting ready uh, for the march past. Basically waiting at this point, I think, for the uh, Governor General to get to the saluting base. Rosemary Barton is with us, as was Hannah Thibodeau as well, and will be uh, in a few minutes' time. But Rosie's with us now, and, and you were right up close to, uh, to the memorial while all this was taking place, so you had a different kind of vantage. Uh, than we had across the street here. Uh, what were your thoughts there, Rosa? Well, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, here's a little secret. I have a heater, <laughs> and, and I'm always surprised that these guys and gals <laughs> can sit there with nothing uh, for so long. Um, so, yeah, their, their toughness impresses me also. A couple things stood out for me in, in um, I, I think it was in the prayer given by the, the priest, but also by the rabbi. Very um, overt uh, notions or, or mentions, rather, of PTSD. Uh, the, the priest actually saying, um, that paying tribute to the fallen who took their own lives, which, you know, is, is a little bit of a sort of controversial point. There are people who actually believe that those soldiers who have committed suicide due to PTSD and trauma after uh, being in combat should be counted among the war dead. Um, so the fact that he raised that, I found sort of interesting because it is something that there are people actively pushing for because they believe that this is just sort of a, a delayed a delayed effect of being in combat and that those people, those soldiers, should be recognized in the same way as those who are killed in active combat. Um, and I wonder where that discussion is headed in this country. Uh, well, it, you're right. It is an absolutely a, a major discussion point among a lot of uh, different groups and uh, people responsible uh, for veterans' issues. Brian, you talked to Romeo Dallaire recently. He's very much... Very much prominent on this uh, fact, pointing out uh, that I think it's 54 Afghanistan veterans now have taken their own lives. And uh, who knows how many from previous wars, from the end of the Second World War, First World War did, because people just didn't take it seriously then. But now it is so seemingly directly linked to... Uh, <laughs> the effect of war on a mind that we still don't really fully understand. That's one of the things. We still go to war, we send people to war, but we still do not, as societies, fully understand the effect of war on the human mind. Right. The, uh, you hear the pipes and drums getting going in the background as the uh, parade is about to begin. The Prime Minister shaking a few hands uh, on the way as well. The Globe and Mail has done uh, some remarkable reporting and journalism on this whole issue as well, uh, on the suicide issue. And uh, the question that Rosie raises about, uh, about whether or not those who have taken their own lives as a result of, of what happened to them uh, during uh, conflict and during overseas operations has... Uh, whether or not they should be counted within the, the the bigger totals of of conflict for Canada is is certainly one that is taking hold in, in a number of discussion areas. And not the just in this country no, too. That's right. it, it very much it's a very big discussion in the United States and in Great Britain, where the the same problem uh, has uh, occurred in, in quite horrifying numbers at times. So I think we're going to see a lot of advance in this area in coming years. So a couple of things happen here now. We watch the parade begin, hear the pipes and drums, as we've heard throughout the day. You also saw around the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, 
people beginning to place their poppies. Um, Remembrance Day guidelines are that the poppy comes off after the 11 o'clock service. And here in Ottawa, the tradition has become that the poppy, once it's taken off, is placed on the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. So we'll watch both of those happening. The public hasn't been allowed into that area quite yet, but many of the veterans you saw were already doing that themselves. So we're going to keep our eye on the uh, parade. And, well, let's just listen in here for a moment, because what, it, it's remarkable, the, uh, the crowd showing their appreciation for the veterans as they go by. Let's just watch this for a moment. keep our eye on this, but we also want to have another reflection from Hannah Thibodeau. Uh, you saw earlier when she went and talked to Blanche again, who uh, isn't here this year. She will be next year, she says, for on her 95th birthday. One of the other people that Hannah met over the years was a wonderful vet by the name of Jim Newell. Uh, we talked about him last year because he was unable to be at last year's ceremony. Here's Hannah's story about Jim Newell. What to remember about Jim Newell? He's a role model, if not a hero. During the Second World War, Jim joined the British Army, and he was with the Royal Marines who went into Burma. And then after some months there, they had an opportunity to be transferred back to the UK in preparation for the D-Day invasion. He had helped put American troops on the landing barges for D-Day out of Portsmouth, so he had a, an indirect role on D-Day. He then went into Europe where he was wounded three times, uh, the last time quite severely and almost killed, and that was in March of 45. Jim's company put in an attack across an open field against a farmhouse. The intelligence officer had said there's no enemy there to worry about, when in fact it turned out the German paratroopers held the farmhouse. The company was decimated, Jim was wounded in the leg, uh, artillery rounds came down and he received shrapnel wounds to the right side of the face here which knocked out most of the teeth. When he came to Oshawa uh, he went down put his papers in was enrolled and over the years became the regimental sergeant major and he did that uh, during centennial year 1967. He was always very proud of what he did. Jim was injured severely and lost most of his company uh, and that was the day that Jim remembered what it meant to him, and he wondered why he was there and the rest weren't. He never found the answer. I don't think anyone could. The band exuded charm and, and joy of life. Like, oh really? no, he's my pusher. He started calling me a pusher, and that name stuck. Poor choice of words on his part at the time. He didn't appreciate what the word pusher actually means nowadays. To me, he was a personal hero. Jim left us last year. He passed away at the age of 91. Now, he'd love to have been here. I'd love for him to be here, but it's the way of things. Jim Newell, pretty remarkable fellow, and uh, his friend, Anna Thibodeau. 
Let's go back down and see Hannah right now. Well, look, I have one of those World War II vets, and we gave him a prime location to see the parade. Harold Brooker, yep, there you go. He he actually deserves to be on this red carpet. Yeah. <laughs> now, you're enjoying yourself here. You yeah. have the, the good seat. You're good clapping seat. your hands. Good, good now, interview. Good interview. Well, we're just starting the interview, so I hope it goes well, Harold. Now, first off, you served in World War II. World yeah. War II. Tell me a little bit about your time there. Well, what do you mean about my time? About your time there. Well, I, my mother suffered more than I did. I put it down that way. Well, how was that? Every time they left home, they cry. Aww. Every time they left home, they don't know whether they're coming back again or not. Now, we were talking a bit earlier, and it was kind of scary for you guys there. Yeah. In what way? <laughs> well, you get shot at, it's just square. I don't care who you are. If you get shot at, you're scared. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what different locations did you serve? Locations? Yeah. Went to Normandy, Antwerp, the, the Dunkirk. All those places went right up through uh, and that North Sea and the islands up in the North Sea. And you were artillery. Artillery, yes. So explain a bit Any about tank. your job. Well, our our job was to protect the infantry from tanks coming down. We got, uh, I think we ended up with 18 tanks. We got 18 tanks. Yeah, yeah. What was? And we lost 27 men. You lost 27 men. Yeah. When you come here, you say it's important to remember your friends who didn't make it back. I can't remember them. There's a lot of them. Did anybody say you could remember them? You, you knew who they were, that's all. And they're good men, all good men. Mm -hmm. When there's the moment of silence, what are the thoughts going through your mind? I go blank. I do, I go blank, honestly. I want to thank you for joining us today and thank you for your service. And I know you wanted to say hi to Peter as well. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Peter, I'm gonna throw it back to you. All right, uh, Hannah. Um, you know, these days bring, uh, you know, bring back memories for a lot of people and obviously it's special and painful memories for uh, the veterans. But for all Canadians who have been connected in some fashion to uh, different parts of Canada's various assignments in different places in the world, uh, some in conflict, some in peace, um, there are memories as well, whether it's about a colleague, a brother, a sister, a father, an uncle, a grandfather. Uh, so on this day, uh, we all uh, remember, and for some it is painful. Um, We've managed to give you a couple of snapshots through these past couple of hours of, of different people and the various ways that they remember and who they remember and why they remember. Uh, Carolyn Dunn has a great story out of Alberta we want to share with you uh, about a man who spends his time in a very special way in terms of remembering. Here it is. It began as a solitary mission. Eric Dahl wanted to honor the Canadian veterans who have always held a special place for him. They really aren't just names on a stone. They, they mean something to me. His desire in part was to pay tribute to his grandfather. Able seaman Daniel Keenan Hume had served in the Navy in the Second World War. When HMCS Regina was torpedoed off the coast of England in 1944, Hume was severely wounded, but survived. Money is scarce these days, so Dahl decided to use what he has, time, two able hands, and some wire brushes. And he went about the job of cleaning off years of weather, dirt, and moss from veterans' graves, as many as he could manage before Remembrance Day. It's something visible. It's something that I feel good about doing. It's the least I think I can do for our veterans. When people learned about Eric Dahl's one-man mission, it turned into a bit of a movement. It inspired Betty Ann Stainbrook to help. I sat and talked to that young gentleman most of the time while I was doing it, you know, thanking him for the, you know, for his courage, for his fighting for, you know, the countries that, you know, he fought for. They didn't have to be asked 
to, to, to go to war. They, they knew what was in front of them, and they just put up their hands and went. Like Dahl's grandfather, who didn't talk much about the war before he died. And there's a post a notice of your grandfather yeah. and his injury. Hume's official war records remain sealed to the general public, but we found a Legion notice with a revelation and shared it with Dahl. I have no idea. Daniel Keenan Hume was listed as a prisoner of war in Stalag 5, Germany. Knowing that missing piece of his grandfather's history has deepened his commitment to clean as many veterans' graves as he can. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Drumheller, Alberta. My name is Pauline Macrodemetris and I'm from Winnipeg. My father was in the Merchant Marine and uh, he was away for most of my first two years of life. And uh, I had also had an uncle and, and a cousin who were killed in the, in the Second World War. So I remember them. Time for some quick final thoughts before we sign off from those of uh, my colleagues who have been working on this program today, starting with Rosie Barton. Rosie. Well, I just I point to the way the, the the weight of some of this for the Prime Minister today, as he contemplates not only the fact that we have about 300 soldiers fighting uh, in Iraq right now, helping the Kurds to take back Mosul, but as he tries to make a decision about where 600 other soldiers are going to head in the peacekeeping missions uh, that are going to start soon, probably in the new year. The, the weight of today probably uh, was quite heavy on his shoulders as he contemplated the risk for those people that he sent out there. All right, Rosie, thank you. And uh, Hannah Thibodeau with some, once again, remarkable interviews with veterans today. Your thoughts? Peter, um, I am so fortunate to be able to stand here and be able to talk to people like Harold, who was here to share those emotional stories. And years later, decades later, they still hit them right in the heart. And not only that, it is so brisk and cold down here that they come out to pay tribute to their friends and loved ones who didn't make it back. But all the people, too, they couldn't even see the service, are lined up down the road to also pay tribute to those veterans who paid the ultimate sacrifice. And that's just something that touches everybody here. All right. Thank you, Hannah, as always. Uh, Brian Stewart. Well, I think, Peter, again, one's surprised in a way that one doesn't become inured to this this day. It still remains one of the great family days of Canada, like July 1st. And uh, none of its none of its strength ever uses out. There's still the same emotion that one felt uh, when one was a young child seeing your first one, really. It's, uh, it's just such the enduring emotion of this day is what I'm always struck by. All right. Thank you, Brian, as yeah. always. Thank you, Peter. Um, so in this last uh, moment or so, a couple of things. We want to warn you of uh, and advise you of the various programs coming up. Continuing coverage on CBC News Network throughout this day uh, about Remembrance Day and about what you've already witnessed and what is still to come. Uh, a special rebroadcast of these ceremonies will be happening uh, later today on News Network at 6 o'clock, between 6 and 8 o'clock Eastern Time this evening and, of course, later tonight on The National. I'd like to uh, thank all of those involved in the uh, CBC broadcast today who've uh, worked so hard, sometimes under uh, trying uh, weather conditions, especially our uh, camera crews out there on the scene. And a special thank you to one Fred Parker. He's our director here at CBC News Specials, and he has been doing Remembrance Day programs like this on this day for the past 30 years. Thanks, Fred, and thank you for watching. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow. Between the crosses, row on row that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. 
And now we lie in Flanders' fields, take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. <laughs> <laughs>